Good morning. <laughs> Great to see everyone this morning. Now that the sun is finally out, show your teeth to someone. Find the person to your right and your left and smile at them. Go. George. Welcome, welcome everyone, and if you are visiting this morning, you get to do something really fun. Look at the end of your pew, there should be a little sheet of paper, it has a couple of questions, just easy questions like, you know, what's your name, your address, and we want you to fill that out and turn it in to the golden plate in a few minutes, so we could just have a record of your visit, we like our visitors, you could just do fun things here, so do that for us please. All right, now before we begin with some announcements, I'm going to let Scotty come on up, he has a couple of announcements for you. Good morning, friends and neighbors. Uh, good to see everybody this morning. I uh, just wanted to remind the youth we'll have snack tonight at 6. That's at Brother Lamar and Miss Diane's home. Uh, they've graciously agreed to host us and let us eat all their food tonight. Please, please bring your swimsuit and your towel. Um, also, we are in search of volunteers to teach Sunday school for the youth. So if that's something you might feel called to do or led to do, Please see me about that. Um, we already have two great volunteers, uh, the Greens back there. And uh, we're looking for uh, just another couple. Or if you just feel called to lead Sunday school, please let me know. I'd love to get you signed up for that. Also, I need one more gracious and loving family to host snack for us on July 24th. So if that's something you're interested in, Please, please see me after service, and I would love to set up a time for us to come and eat all of your food. Thank you. Thank you, Scotty. All right, hopefully you have those bulletins open, but if you don't, let me hear it. Open them up. Okay, good. Great, Pat. A plus. All righty, so look at this afternoon. There's a couple of things going on. There's some meetings. Um, there's a children's meeting going on tonight, this afternoon actually, at 4 o'clock. It will be in Doug Ponder's Sunday School classroom. And I would like to meet with anyone on the Children's Committee. And if you are volunteering for VBS, I would love for you to come and be a part of that meeting as well. And then there's also a Personnel Committee meeting later on this afternoon as well. Um, Thursday, if you check it out, there's an adult get-together. That's every other Thursday, and this Thursday is the one. And um, it starts at, uh, what, uh, six. Sorry, it's, it's a busy, busy bulletin today. It starts at six o'clock, and uh, Mike wanted everyone to know that they'll be grilling out, so you know what that means. Um, just come and eat. Good food. All right, and then Friday night, the young, much younger adults will meet here at five o'clock and we'll go eat dinner and a watch a movie together so be here then young adults and also don't forget to sign up for the perry county mission trip which is uh, coming up july 30th so get your name on the list there should be lists located in any foyer wherever there's a table get your name on there okay there's other things to read about on the inside and on the back make sure you read them okay now i've done enough yapping so now it's your turn Find someone this morning, look around, you see them, you haven't said good morning yet, you haven't kissed their cheek, go, shake their hand, say good morning. No, you. No. No.
my microphone, is it on? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Well, good morning. It's, back. it's good to see all of you here uh, this morning. As some of you have uh, probably figured out, uh, my family is here this morning. I'm just going to introduce them all now. Then you can, don't ask them a whole lot of questions. <laughs> so, uh, but that's my stepmom, Paula, my dad, Paul. That should be pretty easy to remember. Uh, my nephew, William, there, my brother-in-law, Justin, my sister, Stephanie, and my mom, Jackie. And so uh, they're all here this morning. Again, no questions. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so we're glad that y'all are here and uh, glad you are all here as we've gathered this morning for worship. And as we have, let us begin our time together with a word of prayer. Great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, as we are gathered in this place this morning, we know that you have gathered with us. And we trust, Lord, that we feel your spirit in this place as we worship together. God, that our offerings of praise, of song, of prayer, the giving of ourselves, and the open ears we offer to you to hear your word, God, that they may be pleasing to you, and that you may speak to us. God, speak to us in this place, Lord, move among us that we may be changed, that we may be the people you call us to be, and that we may do what it is you call us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture call to worship this morning is Psalm 77, verses 11 through 20. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and rift. The very depths were, were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path lay through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Through your footprints where we are not seen. You led your people like a flock by the land of Moses and Aaron. And we do serve a great God this morning. Let's stand as we bless his name with this great hymn, number 13. I want you to sing it out this morning. <laughs> children make your way up Yeah, I wouldn't want to go. 
Well, good morning. You didn't have to move away, Levi. Good morning. Good morning. Man. Can, can, did we just start up? What, what did I do? All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. All right. All right. You know what? Let's just let's just talk for a minute. Um, let me ask you guys some. What do you think is like a, the most important rule you can? I'll tell you one. When I was a little kid, my dad may remember this since he's here now. Um, when my granddaddy was alive, one of the most important rules was you could not wear a hat in the house. Is that right? I remember even when I was real little. I didn't know granddaddy very long, but you couldn't wear a hat. I remember that. Don't wear a hat in the house. You come in, you had to take it off. Okay, you couldn't wear a hat in the house. I remember my other granddaddy. Mom made me remember this. Um, in, that, in their house, they all sat at the dining room table, and you did not sit in Paul's seat. You, did, you could do anything else, but you didn't sit in Paul's seat. You didn't sit there. And those are really important rules. You could do anything else just about as long as you didn't break those two rules. And when I went to school, I felt like the most important rule was you can't chew gum. Isn't that ridiculous? You, can, you st- can you still not chew gum at school, teachers? No? It's like I thought gum was like some kind of acid that like rotted your brain or something. <laughs> And so now I'm just like, if I were a teacher, man, I'd be letting everybody chew gum. But then again, I don't have to clean it out of the desk, I guess. Um, but you know, Jesus, uh, when we look at the Bible, some people see this as a lot of rules you have to follow. But Jesus said, I'll tell you what, I'll make it real simple. There's just really one rule that sums them all up. He said it's this. Love God and love everybody else. That's it. He said everything else hangs on those two things. Everything else, that's what it's all about. Just love God and love everybody else. And if you can get that figured out, you're doing pretty good. That's pretty easy to remember, isn't it? Now, I don't want you to, to go home and when your dad and your mom say, now, I need you to do this, don't go, well, the preacher said all I got to do is love God and love everybody else, and I'll have to do that. <laughs> but doing those things means you love God and love other people, okay? So I want you to remember that. Next time maybe you see a list of rules, or next time somebody tells you these are the rules, or somebody tries to tell you the Bible says these are the rules, Remember, Jesus said the most important rule is to love God and everybody else, okay? Can I pray with you before we go to some children's church? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for our children. I thank you for the witness they give us, and I thank you so much that you love us, and that's what you call us to do most of all. In your name we pray, amen. Fanny Crosby is my favorite hymn writer. I just loved her lyrics. And before we sing this hymn, 299, I wanted to read you the third verse that we very rarely sing, but we're going to sing it this morning. It says in the third verse, Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that are broken can vibrate once more. Isn't that beautiful? We are called to rescue the perishing and to care for the dying. We serve a merciful Savior. Amen? Let's stand as we sing this great song. 299, Rescue the Perishing.
remain standing as we sing the first and the last verse of this great hymn, Victory in Jesus. Sing it out. You know this one. Here we go. Everybody sing it. I heard an old
Let's stand. Praise God from going to sing a medley of some familiar hymns. If you know them, sing along with us, okay? Lord be with you. Pat, is this, is this yours or is it mine? Uh, it's yours if you want. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make sure, you know, I didn't see lipstick on it, so I knew it wasn't Linnell, so. Uh. 
Sometimes, you know, if it's not clear and see-through around here, you got to be careful. <laughs> Especially if it's got a towel in the bottom of it. You all know what I'm talking about. And so, um, <clears throat> let's look this morning in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then verses 13 through 25. Galatians chapter 5, there we are, verse 1, verses 13 through 25. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. And whatever words, Lord, I may put in the way, may we quickly forget them and hear only what you have for us. And may it change us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, a man, a scribe, a lawyer, an expert in the scriptures, one day approached Jesus with a question. He had apparently heard some of Jesus' teachings and felt like he was the guy to talk to. And so he strolled up to Jesus one day and he said, All right, Rabbi, you seem pretty sharp on all this stuff, so I want to ask you this question. What's the most important, the greatest commandment? Now, I suppose he likely already had maybe picked out his favorite one. Maybe, maybe he was strolling along on that day and passed one of those yard signs. You see them, white, red letters, the Ten Commandments. Maybe he had strolled past it and goes, you know what, I, I, one of those has got to be the most important. Maybe, maybe he was a trader of donkeys and thought the do not covet your neighbor's at donkey uh, was the most important one. It says something else, by the way, in the King James. So. Or maybe, maybe he thought oh, it should be, be remember the Sabbath. That was really important, right? Keeping the Sabbath, keeping it holy. Maybe, maybe that was his, or, or maybe it was do not kill. That seems to be a humanly universal one. Across all cultures, no matter their religion, it seems to be a capital crime to kill someone. Don't kill. Maybe that was the important one. Or maybe, maybe he had just been to church that morning and thought it should be, you shall have no other gods before me. Whatever it was, maybe he already had one in mind. That's usually how it goes with a loaded question. The one asking it already has an answer ready, already thinking of what the answer should be, and they're simply waiting to see if the person who, whom they've asked the question is going to give them their answer. Now, in one version of the story, Jesus actually turns the question back to the lawyer and asks him, he says, okay, well, you, you smart, you've read the Bible, what does the Bible say? What does the scripture say? And the man says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Shema, it's very popular. It's every Israelite would have known it. And Jesus says, yeah, you're getting close. You're getting close. But in other versions of the story, particularly Matthew and, and I think it's Luke's version, 
Jesus replies back to the man and says, The first commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he just takes a brief, brief breath, I think, and says, But the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. That's a pretty straightforward answer. Not a lot of room for wiggling in there. But I have a feeling I know what happened. I have a feeling I know what happened after Jesus gave such an answer. It's like a conversation I had a few weeks ago. Someone came up to me and said, Chris, what do you think would happen if Jesus just showed up in our Sunday school room? What do you think would happen if Jesus just showed up in our Sunday school class one day, sat down in the chair and said, all right, y'all, I'm going to lay it out for you. Here it is. And then he just laid it out, told us what to believe, what not to believe, how to live, how to behave. And then he just got up and left, disappeared. What do you think would happen? I told him, I said, I know exactly what would happen. Right after he disappeared, or more likely walked out the door and walked down the road to have breakfast with some homeless friends, Jesus would have left the room, and there would have been a brief, awkward silence, maybe the rustling of a few of the onion-skinned pages of a Bible, and then someone would say, okay, y'all, this is what he really meant. Because that's what we do. I don't doubt that there were people in the crowd after, who heard Jesus, after hearing him say, love God and love your neighbor as yourself, who would have nudged someone else and said, now you know what he really means when he says that. We do that. We do that, you know. We, we, when the teachings of Jesus are pretty plain, when he lays it all out there in black and white, when we hear it like a refrain running throughout all of the scriptures, we feel like we've got to clarify it. Like we've got to, to bend and mold it, push it down into our own understanding, to our comfort level, our preconceived notions of what it means to be right. Rather than allowing the words of Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit to change us, to free us from the bondage of such notions as you've got to do right to be right. We'd rather search the words of the Bible, looking for a list of rules, a full description of what it means to be a so-called good Christian and then we hold ourselves and others hostage under those rules. We say things like, the Bible says, hoping, hoping to find some justification in our apparent need for such love-limiting laws. But the truth is, the truth is, we're just not all that comfortable with the notion that it's just that simple. That there isn't a list of do this and don't do that. That the love of God is unconditional and unrestricted. It makes us squirm. It makes us uneasy with discomfort because really, truthfully, it leaves too many loose ends. I think those of us who call ourselves Christ followers have had that problem really from the very beginning. Maybe it's a suspicion kind of, sort of hardwired into all the reptilian parts of our brains that makes it hard to believe that something can be too good to be true. Maybe it's unconfessed guilt, the feeling that we're really not that good. We're really not good enough. We don't deserve the love of God that causes us to want clearly defined rules. If I can't deserve it, at least I can earn it. If I'm not worthy of it, at least I can figure out how to get it. So we want a list of rules. We want thickly drawn lines. And maybe it's the realization that if the whole of who God is, of who Christ calls us to be, is love, unconditional, unrestricted love. And that means we have to love those we don't like, those who are different from us, those who we may believe that the Bible says is not worthy of our love. Maybe it's some combination of these things that leads us to lists rather than love. I have a feeling that that was what drove the group of Paul's opponents in Galatia. We talked about them a little bit last week. Those who believed that it was important first to be a good Jew, and then you could be a good Christian. That men had to be circumcised, that dietary laws had to be followed, that ritualistic rules regarding the Sabbath had to be observed. And I don't doubt that a part of what drove such a group was the need to have a list of rules, a clearly defined prescription for good Christian people, and what better place to find such rules than Scripture? 
and the customs derived from them. Paul, however, sees the need for such a list of prescriptions as slavery. Paul sees it as bondage. He says to the people in Galatia, For freedom Christ has set us free, so stand firm, brothers and sisters, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, for you were called to freedom. Those are nice sounding words. You can get them and needle point on a pillow on your couch. Maybe as a Facebook status, a tweet. That's nice. But they're more than just Bible sounding words. In the verses that follow, and what's not included in our text today, Paul argues against the sort of uh, prescribed necessity of circumcision, against the notion that one has to submit to the laws, the traditions and customs derived from the Hebrew Scriptures, our Old Testament, in order to be a follower of Jesus. And then in the rest of our text this morning, Paul reminds the Galatians and his opponents there of Jesus' words about the commandments. While they were fretting over following the letter of the law, crossing every T, dotting every I, Paul reminds them about what Jesus said about the law. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul takes the whole love God part for granted. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. To which I'm sure some folks muttered under their breath or passed notes in the pews that said, actually, you know what he really means by that. You see, for Paul, and I would argue for Jesus, this greatest commandment of of loving God and neighbor isn't simply some excuse to do whatever you want, some nullification of definition when it comes to following Jesus. On the contrary, I believe it's a pretty radical, transformative, life-giving ethic. I believe it's actually a call to an even higher way of living. And Paul, Paul actually lays out a rather detailed description of such Christ-like living in verses 15 through 23 when he contrasts the work of the flesh with the fruits of the Spirit. And then in the second half of verse 23, and then verse 24 and 25, he says, There is no law against such things, that is, the fruit of the Spirit. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. In other words, if we are done living by the fleshly desires that cause us to harm ourselves, that cause us to harm others, if we are done drawing lines around ourselves and around others based on these works of the flesh, then we ought to be guided by the same Spirit that reminds us time and time and time again That the greatest commandment from God is to love one another, to not have lists. But the truth is, we like those lists. In fact, I think some people, some of us, and I know me, may be tempted to take these words from Paul and to start new lists. In verses 19 through 21, Paul says this, Now the works of the flesh are obvious, and it's a list. Can you hear it? Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and just in case he doesn't get it all, and things like these. So you can't worm out of it. He says, I'm warning you, I'm warning you, as I warned you before, Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there is a temptation to take this list, write it down, and run with it. To use it as a checklist, to run down all of these works of the flesh and do this, write names out beside them. I know who does that. I know who does that. Oh, I know who does that. But I hope you've noticed what I did. You see, I... I, This may come as a shock to you. I'm not a sorcerer. That's what's listed there, right? I'm not a sorcerer. I'm not a drunk. Not a carouser. Some other things on this list, I'm not. But uh, but I get jealous. I've been angry. I'm not really sure how Paul defines impurity, but I'm pretty sure he'd put a check by my name there too. In fact, if I had to test myself against this list, I'd fail every single time. And I'd hate to hate to tarnish your ego, but you probably would too. But let's not dwell on the bad stuff, right? That's not what we're here for. Let's not dwell on the bad stuff. What about the fruit of the Spirit? 
We sing children's songs about such things, so that's happier, right? That will play out better. That's a better list for me, right? I'm a preacher. That's a better list. Let's see. Paul says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those all sound really nice. That's a great little list. Those make a better list. A more positive way to discern if someone is in. Now we're not talking about the bad stuff. Now we're talking about the good stuff. But hold on. If I go down this list, checking boxes for myself, I'm afraid I'll only be disappointed again. Love. Sure, I love people. I love the folks who I find worthy to love. The folks I find easy to love. The folks that don't cause me too much trouble. Those people I don't like. Those people who seek to do me harm. Those who are my enemies, my opponents, my constant source of frustration. Uh, uh oh. Joy? Well, only when the situation calls for it. You can't walk around all happy clappy all the time. Peace? Yeah, Christmas time. Yeah, Christmas time, peace. Let there be peace on earth. All that. I'm not singing all that stuff. Patience. Ask Sally. She's in the nursery. <laughs> no, seriously, ask Sally when we're getting ready to go somewhere and Cole's still running around in a diaper that needs to be changed. Am I patient? Patience. Kindness. Ask someone I've been short to when I've had a rough morning. And this isn't looking good. Generosity. Now, you can ask the IRS. They might say, he seems fairly generous. But ask the people I drive by on the highway without stopping if I'm generous. Or the people whose homes have busted windows and trash out in the yard that I drive by every single day. Ask them if I'm generous. Gentleness? Maybe, but there, there are a lot of holes in the, in the concrete in my garage from where I might have hit them with a hammer, from being frustrated. And self-control. Now look, y'all have seen me eat. Look at me. Do I look like someone with self-control? Especially if it's got peanut butter, if there's ice cream. And here I was thinking, this is a better list. Running down it. Oh. But maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's what Paul really means. Maybe that's what Jesus really means. By summing up the whole law this way, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe Paul was on to something when he says we are called to freedom to become slaves to one another through love. Because maybe there's an inherent futility in our desire to live by lists, laws, and labels. To bind ourselves up with rules, rituals, and restrictions. Perhaps in our incessant need to clearly define who's in and who's out, who's right, who's wrong, we've forgotten the whole point in the first place. We've forgotten the whole point of this life. You see, it's not our place to write the lists, to draw the circles, to say who does or doesn't belong. Because the truth is, we're likely on somebody else's list. I'm probably on some of y'all's. I know I'm on some of y'all's list. And it ain't on the good side, I know. That's okay. You may not be on my good list. But really, it's not our point, not our reason to draw the list. Such a place belongs to the one who gave his life in the ultimate act of selflessness. And a God who could have said, I'm done with all of you, and flushed us down a black hole somewhere. To a God who, who controls the cosmos, the universe, to come and say, I'm going to show you. I'm going to die for you. It's up to him to draw the lists. And I have a feeling he doesn't have many, if he has any at all. No, in the end, we are not called to the slavery of self-righteousness. No, in the end, we are called to the selfless enslavement to love one another. To love one another as Christ loves us, without condition, without end, 
without reason. And so may we be free then. Free to love without limitations. Free to serve others without condition. Free to be the people that Christ calls us to be. The people that God has created us to be. May we be free in the unending, all-powerful, eternal, limitless, unconditional love of God. May we be free to love as Christ has loved us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. For Lord, we know we are sinners. We know we are list makers and line drawers, uh, folks who want to exclude and include those on our lists. Help us, Lord, to hear the words you've shared with us through Scripture. Your Holy Spirit, speak to us and help us, God, to be selfless people, enslaved not to lists of rules and laws, but, Lord, enslaved to one another in love, that we may serve each other as we serve you. So come now, Holy Spirit, move among us, speak to us, show us, Lord, ways that we may be more and more like your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, hymn 366. May you go forth from this place seeking to listen to the voice of the Christ who calls you not to lists, but to love. Would you pray with me? Lord God, go with us from this place. Go with us into our lives. Go with us as we go out into this world, Lord, and may we show others not lists, but your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.